Radio EcoShock. New science reports ice loss from glaciers in the mighty Himalayas have doubled since the year 2000 due to global heating. That could affect up to a billion people downstream and add to rising sea levels around the world. On June 19th, four scientists published their paper, Acceleration of Ice Loss Across the Himalayas Over the Last 40 Years. Here to help us is co-author Dr. Summer Ruper, Associate Professor in the Geography Department at the University of Utah from Salt Lake City. Summer, welcome to Radio EcoShock. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. How substantial is the amount of ice in the Himalayas? So we don't actually know the exact volume of ice in the Himalayas. We know that it's the Himalayas hosts more snow and ice than any region outside of the polar regions. But the exact volume is still uncertain because it's difficult to see to the bed or to, you know, the rock beneath ice itself. What we do know is that they are significant contributors to water resources for populations living downstream. We know the Arctic is far hotter. Are the great mountains along China and India heating up in a similar way? They are. In fact, um, one of the things we did is um, compile weather station data from across the Tibetan Plateau, the high Himalayas, and across the entire region, everything that was available. And what we can see is over at least the last 40 to 50 years, there's been a significant increase and accelerating increase in temperatures in the high mountain regions. Yes, they just had a heat wave in northern India. I'm sure that extended into Tibet. And the Chinese were saying as long ago as 2009 that uh, Tibet was heating up much more than expected. Yeah, the the rate of warming seems to be accelerating. And this is actually somewhat similar to what we're seeing in a lot of high mountain regions, and that is the warm, warming seems to be amplified at higher elevations than, than down lower, actually. And there's quite a bit of work trying to understand why that is the case, but it, we know it is certainly happening, and that that really does put these high mountain systems at risk from climate change. Summer, please take whatever time you need to describe how your team determined the rate of loss in the Himalayas has doubled since the year 2000. Okay, one of the difficult things in the Himalayas is that it's simply so remote, right? It's extremely hard to get there. Once you do get in, it's it's really difficult working environment. Uh, there's safety issues. It can be difficult to even access some glaciers because they sit at uh, politically controversial borders, things like that. So there's very limited sort of boots on the ground filled evidence for what's happening on glaciers. There is some, and the evidence that we have from field observations do show that these glaciers have been shrinking or retreating, getting smaller over over time, but these are, you know, very limited numbers of, of glaciers, and there are thousands of glaciers in the Himalayas, and it's a very complex region, so it always begs the question of uh, how representative is a single glacier of this much, much larger region. When looking at the larger region, we te- typically rely on remote imagery, like from satellites, And most of the work that's been done is use these modern-day satellites really the last decade or so. But in terms of either glacier or climate change, that's a really short period of time. So we've utilized those as well, but what we really wanted to do is get much further back where we could see what's really happening, what do the trends really look like, and how does that compare to what climate system has been doing. And so what we ended up doing was tapping into these historical spy satellite images that were just recently declassified. These were satellites that were launched in the 1970s as part of the, you know, the height of the Cold War era with the, really the sole goal of uh, peering over the Iron Curtain. It was, I've heard it described as these being similar to a 1970s version of, of Google Earth, right? You had near global coverage of images from the 1970s. But what's unique about these images is that they're overlapping. So you have essentially a view of the Earth in stereo. So we can use these stereo images to reconstruct the three-dimensional surface of the Earth from the 1970s. This was a a difficult task. Typically what people have been doing was processing these images manually, which is incredibly time-consuming, and also wrought with uncertainty at times. 
especially in the Himalayas, because the manual method requires lining these images up with known sort of GPS points, so a road intersection where you know exactly where it is in space and its exact elevation. But in the Himalayas, you don't have a lot of man-made structures. A lot of time has passed in 40 or 50 years, so a lot of erosions, landslides. So one of the things my my former student did and, and lead author on this paper was develop a new algorithm where we could automatically process these stereo images. And this allowed us to sweep across the entire Himalayan range, capturing glaciers from east to west across a a 2,000 kilometer, more than 1,200 miles of landscape, um, and look at how glaciers have been changing, not just in terms of the area that they cover, but the actual volume of ice that has been lost from the 1970s all the way to present. But there could be other factors, as you talk about in your paper. Industrialization in Asia has deposited black carbon, which attracts more heat. And the monsoons, as we know, have decreased somewhat in recent years. Maybe there's less precipitation in the mountains to form ice. How do you know these are not the cause of the new melt rate instead of global warming? Yeah, that's a really good question. And actually, the thing to make clear is that these things do affect the glaciers, right? If we change the amount of snowfall falling on a glacier, it will change its mass and its size. But the trends in precipitation are not consistent across the full range of the Himalayas, right? The western Himalayas are dominated by westerly storm tracks, not the monsoon, for example, whereas the eastern Himalayas, most of the precipitation coming in is actually coming in the summertime due to monsoonal rains. But the reality is precipitation trends across the Himalayas is not consistent. It hasn't been decreasing everywhere, so that's very unlikely to be the cause. The second thing with the aerosols is that's equally heterogeneous, right? It's it's not something that's happening across the entire range of the Himalayas for all glaciers, and we are seeing mass loss of all different types of glaciers across the entire span of the Himalayas. But the the clearest way for us to show what the driving force was is that, you know, we know how much energy it takes to melt ice. And so what we can do is we can say, well, how much temperature does temperature have to change to melt the volume of ice that we've seen lost over this period of time? And when we do that calculation, that number matches very closely. Um, It's actually right in the same range as what we're actually observing from the weather stations. So what that's saying is not that, you know, these other things like industrialization and essentially um, air pollution, you know, and and these dark particles from dust and black carbon getting on the glaciers, they can have an effect and changes in precipitation can have effect. But temperature over this period has just dominated the changes. It's overwhelming everything. Now, I would have said more water coming from the mountains would be a benefit to farmers and cities downstream in Tibet or China or India. But your paper also mentions, quote, increasing risk of outburst floods due to expansion of unstable proglacial lakes. What is that about, and has it happened already? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, and I'd like to address both those points. So one, what happens immediately is as a glacier thins and retreats, the water tends to, a lot of the water, not all of it, but some of the water pools and lakes at the, the terminus of the glacier, and it's dammed by these just very tenuous rocky rubble moraines left behind by the glaciers. And what happens is these, these dams can breach, and you get these massive outburst floods downstream, and it's steep topography, right? So it doesn't take much water to have a really impactful flood. And what we've seen across the Himalayas is as these glaciers are shrinking, the number and size of these glacial lakes is increasing. And we have seen several outburst floods, and these are incredible hazards for the people and the infrastructure downstream uh, of these glaciers. And it's also, I think, worth noting that not always, but often, these mountain communities are some of the, the poorer communities of our world. And so these impacts are also, they're very vulnerable because they don't have the resources to um, essentially address these issues on their own. And the second issue is that as these glaciers respond to climate change, we do start to flood the rivers with more and more water. But what happens is as the glaciers continue to shrink or get smaller, at some point the size becomes so small that you actually hit what's called peak water, where 
you now no longer continue to increase the amount of water in the, entering the river system. You actually decrease it, and you start to head towards less and less water entering these river systems downstream. And so the long-term prospect of glacier change is actually a significant decrease in uh, glacier meltwater feeding these, these river systems. According to the fifth assessment report of the IPCC, more sea level rise is coming from mountain glaciers than from melting ice sheets in the Arctic or in Antarctica. I find that a remarkable fact. I don't think many people know that. So this ice loss in high mountain Asia will affect coastlines around the world. It will, and it will continue to do so as long as we continue on the path we're on. So these mountain glaciers, because they do respond very quickly to changes in climate in comparison to the big ice sheets, over the next 100 years, they will be you know, the, the dominant contributor to sea level rise other than you know, expansion due to warming of the oceans itself. So the mountain glaciers will continue to contribute more to sea level rise, and the rate at which we melt these glaciers will directly impact the rate at which sea level rises. In 2010, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change withdrew a prediction that glaciers in the Himalayas could disappear by the year 2035. But could some glaciers disappear there, and can we estimate when? So the yeah the mistake in the IPC report was that it essentially said that we would lose all glaciers by 2035, which uh, scientists immediately said that's not accurate. What we are seeing is that the rate of loss is accelerating and will continue to accelerate. We will certainly lose, and we have lost some glaciers already in high mountain Asia or in the Himalayas. What we're hoping is that this new data set actually gives us more confidence in projections because it will provide a data set by which we can contest the validity of our glacier models. Right now, the projections for 2100 are that we could lose anywhere between 30 and 70 percent of the glacier ice in the Himalayas. Even at that low end, that's a very significant loss. At the high end, that is, well, it's very detrimental to ecosystems and populations relying on those glaciers. And so we're hoping what will happen is that this new data set will help us narrow that range of projections a little bit and, and decrease the uncertainty in our expected response of these glaciers to to future climate change. Dr. Ruper, how does ice loss in the Himalayas compare to the more famous shrinking alpine glaciers in the European Alps? It's actually a little bit slower. Um, It follows the same trend in terms of the pattern. What we've seen is that in the, the Alps, mass ice loss has been accelerating over time and we're seeing that in the Himalayas as well. The Himalayas are a bit lower latitude, and they're much, much higher, so they're much colder. So they're a little bit behind the Alps glaciers in terms of the magnitude of mass loss, but that's that's unlikely to stay true at this pace. You just said 30 to 70 percent ice loss in the Himalayas, if I heard you correctly, by the year 2100. That's an astounding mass. That could possibly change the the wobble of the earth or or the location of the poles or something big like that? No. I I mean, the mass of ice, by comparison to, say, the the lithosphere or the solid rock underneath, is actually still quite small. Um, What it can do, though, is have interesting fingerprints on sea level rise. So we tend to think of sea level rise as being, if you throw water in, you get equal rise everywhere, but that's, that's not actually how it works. Um, because the mass of, say, something like Antarctica has a gravitational pull on sea level. Losing mass from a place like Antarctica would then mean that you have less of a pull on sea level rise. Sea level in that region, you can actually have a lowering there, which just then enhances sea level rise other places. So the idea is that as we lose mass from one region, it changes essentially the fingerprint of sea level rise all over the globe in very complex ways. So it's it's actually, you will see global sea level rise, but some regions will fill it more than others. If the rate of ice loss in the Himalayan glaciers has doubled since the year 2000, is it possible it could increase or even double again if our greenhouse gases continue to increase as they're doing now? Yeah, I, I'm afraid so. That That's a distinct possibility. It's 
it's one of these questions where um, as temperatures warm, ice responds immediately, right? Same as our snowpack, right? As, as from year to year, when when temperatures start to get warmer, snow starts to melt, right? And it melts faster and faster as it gets warmer and warmer. Ice does the same thing. The difference with ice is it's it's dynamic. It's a flowing, moving body, and so it it also has a geometric response to that that change in in ice. So as we lose ice, the glacier tends to thin, thin, but then it slowly starts to change its geometry and retreat. And the the actual pace of that mass loss depends on both climate and the time scale it takes a glacier to actually change its shape. And that becomes a very interesting scientific problem, but it means that effectively that rate of mass loss depends on two things. And it will likely continue to accelerate for some period of time and then the rate of ice loss will will slow down a bit as these glaciers get quite a bit smaller. Is there good cooperation between Chinese and Indian scientists working on this problem? <laughs> um, between individual scientists, I think so, right? As a group, it becomes very difficult just because of some of the political tensions that occur between these these different groups. So individual scientists try hard to collaborate and work together where they can, but that's not always possible depending on the politics at that moment in time. So it's it's limited, but it's that's driven more by the larger governmental politics and not so much by the desires of the individual scientists in those countries. What research would you like to see done next? Um, I would really like us to, to really pin down the impacts of changes in glaciers on water resources for individual communities across the Himalayan range, because that will vary from one place to the next. In some regions, um, changes in glaciers may have a much smaller impact than others, and I think understanding when and where these changes will have the biggest impacts on these mountain communities is incredibly valuable information and I think would be a really good path forward. Bottom line, Summer, as we wrap up here, can we now say with confidence that global warming is accelerating glacier melt in the high mountains of Asia? Undoubtedly, yes. From the University of Utah in Salt Lake City, we've been speaking with Dr. Summer Ruper. She is co-author of the new study, Acceleration of Ice Loss Across the Himalayas Over the Last 40 Years. You can find links to the full text of the paper and press coverage in my show blog at ecoshock.org. I know you have been swamped with media requests, Summer. Thank you for sharing time with our listeners. It was my pleasure. Thank you. I'm Alex Smith reporting for Radio Ecoshock. Check out the Radio Ecoshock website. We're at ecoshock.org.